Good morning, friends. Having a little technical challenge here this morning, so bear with me. I am out here in the garden, and I wanted to kind of kick off our seed starting Saturday today, taking a look at our very first warm season bed that's been planted, and just want to kind of just share a couple tips with you. Then we're going to move inside. So if throughout this we lose connection, this is all a test y'all as always, right? So just hang on, I will be back. And so I am sitting here at our first bed and um, we're gonna take a look at how we handle this. But before we get started, let's just do our housekeeping. Um, so we're gonna look at this bed. Then we're also gonna make a pit stop on the porch where we just have a ton of seedlings at all different kinds of stages that are hardening off. And then we're gonna go inside and I'm gonna be starting the last of my cool flower experiment which are cool season hardy annuals. And today I'm gonna um, be sowing some snapdragons, the very last ones. It's those that Potomac, that variety that um, blooms best at long warm days like summer. And we're just kind of like pushing the envelope there. And then we're gonna also of course, sow our weekly sunflowers. So I'm sitting here out here in our field um, this is our first block of beds that'll be planted with our first warm season tender annuals. You can see over here that um, there's three beds that are made that aren't planted yet. This is a that'll this will progressively happen over the next week or two. And um, because we are, I am in southeastern Virginia. My classic last historic frost date is mid-April. And, but what that doesn't mean that it's warm enough for warm season tender annuals. Um, while the days are hot, y'all, that's why I have my favorite hat on. Um, it's hot during the days, but y'all, it is still chilly at night. It's still going down into the low 50s and even in the high 40s. And no, that classically won't kill this group of plants, the warm season, but it doesn't help them. What's the point of planting early if you don't make the most out of it, right? So we use this black film, which is Bio360. You can learn all about that over on my website, thegardenersworkshop.com. I've used it for 10 years, would not be farming um, or even gardening at this point without it. I don't think doing as much as I do because it just minimizes weed pressure. Um, and then it has some other good qualities like what I'm using it for now. We make our beds with the black side up of this film. The other side is gray to maximize the heat part of this. However, because our days are warm, we don't want to overheat our seedlings. So I am going to now um, pop out of the way um, and let you see this bed. But before we do that, I'm sorry, y'all, I did not even look at my list of announcements that I need to make. The other big announcement I really wanted to make is that you're all invited. Um, our once a year annual open garden is happening here on May 7th, which is the day before Mother's Day. I know it, y'all. It was either that day or no day this year because of the construction here on our property. The garden and the warehouse will be open. They're four miles apart. We welcomed people from all over the country last year. We already know people are coming from the most furthest away places on the continental United 48 states. Um, and so you can go to the gardener's workshop. There's a link right on the home page if you're watching this before it takes place. Um, and all the information is there, airports, hotels, what you can expect. Um, and of course, our good friend Dave Dowling will be joining me, the superstar flower farmer. He'll be here for you to pick his brains. Our peonies should be either blooming or on the verge. And Dave will be stationed there. And so the other thing I wanted to say to you, and then we'll get started here, is that the biggest myth that we face right now is that people think that seed starting is a do it now or never um, kind of mentality. And it's like they think that if they miss this time right now, there's nothing to start. Friends, I am here to tell you that we started starting seeds in January and haven't stopped and we won't stop until November. And really we could even start in December, but I just take the month off. It totally depends on where you live. Of course, people in the most northern regions don't have that wide, 
but there is almost always something to be started at least six months out of a year. So don't let that myth mess you up. Um, so with that said, we are always starting seeds. We're always, crops are ending, crops that have failed. I have a crop right now of agristem, a corn cockle, that is just puny. And you know what? I was walking past it this morning. I thought, you better believe I'm pulling that out because I have something I can plug in there right away. And that's kind of how this whole system works. So I'm going to pop out of the way so that we can take a look at this bed. So what you're looking at is a bed that has been planted with marigolds and cosmos. That's what we had ready first. And they need the protection at night, but this is what I do to them during the day. I lift up, um, the afternoon sun comes from that direction, and that's what I want this bed protected from. That's when that black film can really get hot on the top which is warm in the soil, y'all. It's doing what I want it to do, but I don't want to toast my seedlings. So I just use these clips and roll the row cover up. So, and I'm clipping it partially on the row cover and on the hoops. Um, you can find row covers, hoops, and bags, and the film over at the gardener's workshop. So I just wanted you guys to see, so this is kind of how the bed looks during the day. And tonight, if the temperatures are going to be um, above mm, 60 in a perfect world, then I would just leave it like this. Um, but if it's going to drop below, I'll just drop these covers, throw the, row, the weight bags down on them, and um, see what tomorrow brings. So I'm going to take you off of this stand, and I'm going to walk you along. Sorry, fellas. Um, and so let me, I think I have to go to settings. I want to turn the camera around and see if I can't. I'm going to do it, y'all. All right. Stand by, y'all. All right. So here is that garden. And if you can see, you can see the wind is kind of flapping. Um, but this row cover, I'm going to walk inside. You can see there's a weight bag down at every hoop. See, there's a hoop. Hoops are 10 to 12 feet apart. We just walk it off. Here's the cosmos. You can see some got toasted. So, isn't that interesting? Those didn't. Did that one not get appropriate water? when it was being watered, you know, I mean, stuff happens. That's one of the gifts of us planting so densely for cut flower growing. And see, here's several. There's one toasted. There's one. Stuff happens, y'all. But we plant so densely that it is just not a problem. So we have 14, we're growing all 14 varieties of the Cosmos that you'll find over on our, um, store and i'm just so thrilled to share that if you check out the may issue of the better homes and garden one of our good friends who's a garden writer marty ross did an article on cosmos all right friends i'm gonna give you i'm gonna walk back to the building now so um, i'll just give you a view of something better than looking at my mug um back there there's my peonies campanula delphiniums, tuberoses, and poppies cover crop. And these are all the things. And then here's the cool flower garden over there. This is where more beds and my corn will be planted. There's just a whole lot to look at around here, y'all. So let's make a pit stop up here at um, the porch. But what I wanted to share was that May issue of Better Homes and Garden has Cosmos on the cover. Marty did a great article with our friends at Pepper Hollow um, Flower Farm on the West Coast. And, you know, Cosmos are here to stay, friends. All right, so I watered right before I jumped on. I do see that I need to dump some trays. So we're looking at first time out, all these test celosias. Those are the what was left after Bobo planted the cosmos and marigolds those have somewhere to go but i could go plug in where we saw those toasted ones 
there's just all kinds of stuff. Here are all the cool flower tests. Um, some more snapdragon, sweet william, those that are getting ready to be planted. Here is all the first plantings of celosias that are being hardened off. And then here are the trays. There's the corn, sunflowers we've been planting every week. So we just have tons of stuff going on around here, friends. So let's go inside. You know what I wanted to say out there with my hat on? Oh, y'all, we have to walk back out there. I just left the tripod out there. All right, we're going back. Um, what I wanted to share was that row cover does for my bed exactly what a hat does for you in the sun. So anybody that wears a hat on a regular basis, like I do, um, just got it. It's like the difference between, I mean, your body temperature is like lowered, like what, 20 degrees it feels like when you put a hat on. Um, and that's exactly what this little row cover does for these beds. And, you know, I mean, I have said many times before, I could do an all day talk on row covers. I just use it for so many, all right, y'all, sorry. Um, I could use row cover. This is winter rye and clover. I do not recommend people without equipment growing winter rye. See how pretty that is. And the honeybees are here. There is, it is thick. My neighbor's honeybees. So we got to get inside and start our snaps. Um, so that is the hat theory on people is the same as a row cover can be on a bed when it's vented. I mean, when you're doing it for heat, for sun protection, protection your sun, your um, beds from the sun, bright sun, you definitely have to vent it like we just showed, right? So, you know, this is behind the scenes, y'all. See those carts? They block the wind. I'm standing with my back to my garden, and these carts block all these seedlings from the constant wind going through here. All right, friends, here we are. So I am going to um, put you in this stand and then we're going to make our small soil blocks and we are going to sow them. But before we do that, did y'all just catch a glimpse at that? Totally in love with that white flower right there. That is... Um, annual baby's breath it looks nothing like regular baby's breath and totally loving it i mean this stuff is just i mean fall planted and i am hearing from folks um i'm hearing from folks because I posted about it on social media that in zone, I'm in 8A, 7B, more 8A than 7B. Um, I've heard from people in 7A and 6B say that they fall plant the transplant because look at the stem length. I mean, this, look at this. This stuff is just gorgeous. Anyway, we're not supposed to be talking about this. All right, friends, I'm going to turn. I got to redo the camera. I am going to make our small, our small soil blocks. And then we are going to sow the sunflower seeds. All right, so let me turn you down. Um, I got comments last time, and I can see your comments, by the way. Most of them, um, let me move my stuff, that people asking about seeing me make the small soil blocks. All right, so all right, so I'm doing six, I want to have about 60 plants, so that's the, the large, 
foam tray. And of course, yes, this is foam, y'all, but we use it forever. This is not disposable. We use it over and over. So this is the blocking mix. The recipe is always on our website and we sell the ready-made mix. Um, this is a mixture of compost, peat moss, rock phosphate, and green sand. Um, and it's super wet and the recipes tell you how much water to how much soil um, so, or blocking mix. So it's a two-handed job. I wasn't sure I was going to have enough mix in here, but I just decided to go with it. I tend to prefer to be sure that my blocks are firmly packed. I always tend to put my blocks over to the one side of the tray to create the best um, watering well. We're going to make two more of those. And so anybody that's not familiar with soil blocking, there is a ton of resources over on my website, the Gardener's Workshop. There's actually, under the resources, there's a, um, a category called All Things Soil Blocking. On there is the recipe. There are videos. There's videos on the products. You can find the soil blockers on our store. And on the actual blocker page, there's videos also. So, y'all, there is just no end to how you can do it. I've been soil blocking for about 25 years. Super space savvy. Quick and easy to do. I'm trying to be quick about it today, y'all, because people just don't realize not only is it a space saver, but it is super quick. So, that's it. We just made 60. Um, so, now I'm going to take us over here where we're going to actually do the seed sowing, y'all, let me get my camera right. Sorry. Like, this is totally the real thing, right, y'all? You know that. And let me move my, I've got my laptop here in the event that I couldn't see your comments, but it looks like I am going to be able to see your comments, at least for right now. My camera's not very straight. All right. So... So we're going to sew snapdragons in here. The first thing we do is I use masking tape. You know, we did use painter's tape for a while, but we were having problems with the, the marker coming off of it. Um, so I've gone back to masking tape. So this is a new variety of snaps to us. Um, what is today? Today is, gosh, April 23rd. And this is the Potomac. mix snaps somebody left this pen open and i just wrote it on the wrong side maybe no i didn't all right so i always mark first you know it's pretty significant that you need to know the date you started them and then we just stick that here on the end of the tray and i just smashed one of the blocks all right, so snapdragons, as most people know, are pretty tiny, but of course, because we use these, an aluminum seed pan, and you can tell ours are really well worn. I mean, we use them obviously for years. Um, aluminum has no static electricity, y'all. That's why it is so important or significant and helpful to actually use it. It actually comes in um, our um, kits, but you can buy it individually. I mean, I think it's like two bucks or something. It's a lab pan. So these are Snapdragon seeds. So I'm just going to dump a few out here. So I'm not looking to fill, even, let's just say I was doing 240, which is our normal commercial size tray. You want them scattered. That's what makes it easy to pick them up. So we're just going to set these seeds aside. So I need a toothpick. And y'all, I'm not spitting on camera. Saliva is stickier than water, y'all. It is definitely true for me. So I just dip my toothpick, saliva, and then literally because there's no static electricity, 
the seed literally hops right onto your toothpick. And then I am just firmly seeding the seed on the surface of the block. Snapdragons need light to germinate. And the reality of that is it's not just light. They need a lot of oxygen and moisture. And that's why we will put these. Um, see, I think the challenge starting snaps for me personally this late in the season, because, you know, this is a test. This is a cool flower test, right? Um, is getting them to germinate because my grow room is so warm. I may actually try putting these in the um, germination chamber. We'll see how that goes. But that's part of the experiment. Can I even get snaps started this late in the season because they're cool lovers, right? So I'm just touching my toothpick. I mean, this works great on celosia, any of those tiny seeds that people struggle with. This really helps. So the other thing is that um, to help retain the moisture on the surface, you know, there's a lot of things that have to happen all at once for seeds, particularly testy seeds, to germinate. The temperature, the moisture level, and is the seed covered or not covered? Is it what, are you giving it what it actually needs? I will say that snapdragons are one of those ones that people tend to struggle with. And it's, I feel like temperature is the number one thing. Um, once you learn how to manipulate the temperature in wherever, you know, whether it's a spare bedroom, a garage, a, a work building like I have. Um, once you figure out how to change that temperature, for me, it's a matter of whether I leave the door open or not. All right, so I'm just continuing to just t touch the toothpick to this tiny little snap seed. And because it's in this aluminum seed pan, it literally just hops right on. And then once it touches that moist soil, it just releases. So I get a lot of questions about currently, because a lot of people, you know, are starting warm season, right? Marigolds, Cosmos, and Zinnias, which are kind of long skinny seeds, we literally poke them into the soil block, pointy in first, and that gives them what they need. Their tail, that one didn't let go. The tail of the seed is going to be sticking out the top, but that provides what it needs. So that's a really common question that people have. I posted some really beautiful trays, pictures of trays of Cosmos yesterday or the day before. You can find it on Instagram or in Facebook too, I think. Um, and you know, if you're enjoying this sat seed starting Saturday, I really appreciate it if you would subscribe to my channel and share it with your friends. That just helps us. All right, we need more seeds. So I leave my toothpick in the last one that I put a seed in so I don't lose my place because you can't really tell where you have or haven't sown seeds. And so here's the rest of the story. This is part of why soil blocking is so quick and efficient. Y'all, after I do what I'm doing today, these boogers just go through the growing process on a seedling heat mat, then over to grow lights, then out on the carport. They are never potted up, pricked, or whatever people call it when they separate them, when they sew them into trays. They, you don't have to thin them because we have such great germination. You only put one seed per block of any seed that you sow normally. And that's it. We are done. So let's put these seeds away. You know, what you may or may not know is this, these shows that I do for you guys, they aren't scripted. I'm pretty sure you already know this. These are not scripted shows. I am just sharing with you what is actually going on here on my farm, right? So what's going to happen, I'm going to tell you the rest of the story on these Snapdragons. So what I was going to say is I have to put stuff away as I do it because I'll never come back to this, right? Okay, so these I'm going to do, um, 
I think what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put these in the grow room on the seedling heat mats on cookie cooling racks, just like um, I normally do. And then I'm going to lay the, to keep the surface to trap moisture. I don't use plastic or domes because I learned from the person, Elliot Coleman. If you don't know him, you need to look him up. He is like the leader of the organic small market farmer world um, and what has been for the last 40 years. He taught me that using stuff that traps moisture that doesn't allow air circulation is just a breeding ground for disease and fungus. And you really have to monitor closely. Well, let's be honest. I don't monitor closely, y'all. I go into my grow room in the morning. I tend to my seedlings. Everybody gets watered. And they're not seeing me again till the next morning. We have way too much to do on this farm to do that. So that's why I use wide weave burlap. You just lay it on the surface. It traps moisture, but it still allows air circulation. And we have had really good results with that. And you learn very early on that once you see the beginning of cracking of seeds, you get that burlap off because they will quickly grow through that burlap. So that's what I'm going to do. Put them on the seedling heat mat that has a cookie cooling rack on it, which cools down the heat mat just a smidge. Lay the burlap down. Tend to them. Water them each morning. I pour water in the side. I might miss the top. Um, put the burlap back on it. I don't water through the burlap. Um, and wait till they sprout. Then they get moved to grow lights, and they'll get bumped out onto the porch. So again, cool flower experiment number three or number four. I think it's number there's one, two, this is three. Um, and so it may or may not be successful. So I am going to go back and do the questions at the end here. So we're going to do our sunflowers next. And the sunflower thing is really kind of gone wild. Um, cause I mean, people everywhere have been, they've been following along and participated and did the early bird sunflower planting with me. Um, and you can go back and watch um, the YouTube, the Seed Starting Saturdays on Facebook and YouTube, and you can find them on our website. Um, back in mid-March, I started my first sunflower six weeks before my last frost date, which is mid-April. Um, and people are showing off on social media all of their sunflowers that are on the verge, you know, that are coming along. And um, we're just super excited about that. So here's the story about sunflowers. Sunflowers um, can truly change your business if you're a flower farmer. If you're a home gardener and you just want to have sunflowers all through the season or even just like once a month, you just have to time it, friends. We start sunflowers every single week for about 26 to 30 weeks. We start early in the season and just do it every single week. And I'm going to show you how we start them. And then you, we plant them out when they're two to three weeks old um, out in the garden. And that creates a constant supply. Um, one of the things that people kind of sometimes forget about is you need to at least plant one type of sunflower each week that is the same. Like for us, typically it is the bouquet mix, which is a pro cut mix that we create. You can find it on our website. Um, that means the timing is right. If you started different varieties of sunflowers each week, these sunflowers are from seed to bloom in 55 to 60 days. There are some sunflowers that take 120 days from seed to bloom. Do you see what I'm saying? If you started different ones each week, that, they're not going to come in in sequence. So we stick typically to the Pro Cut series and one other that's called Sunfill that's on the same timeline so that our timetable stays in. So this week we are starting, this is the last jumbo package y'all of the peach Pro Cut. We still have the small packs. Um, well, at least when I left work on Thursday, we did. Um, so we're going to be starting the peach Sun Pro Cut Sunflower the sunfill green, which is not a pro cut. This is that sunflower we actually grow for its um, use as a filler in bouquets. The sepals are that green layering of the leafy looking stuff that's on the outside of a bloom. This has so many layers of those 
that they actually look like a succulent before they open. And that's what we grown for is to have green filler to add to our bouquets every single week. It just helps us poof up our bouquets. So we're starting sun fill and then I'm starting my weekly starting of bouquet mix. This Bouquet Pro Cut Mix has four of the oranges. It has the orange, it has the orange XL, which is darker. It has the Brilliance, which is the orange with a yellow halo. And then it has the Horizon, which is orange, but all the blooms face upright. They're awesome. So this is called Pro Cut Bouquet because this would make a beautiful bouquet all by itself. So that's what we're gonna do. Let's make our tape here so I can, um, show you guys what we're doing. Um, so I start the sunflowers. Commercial growers in general always start their sunflowers inside. You use less seeds. You have more success. There's less weed pressure, less labor. So let's, I got to just stop and let me write this because I get so confused. And we have, and you know what I don't have any of this week is my go-to favorite is gold light. Oh, peach. Y'all see, that's what I have to stop and think. And then we have sun fill. All right, so now what are we starting them in? So I'm going to show you. Um, and you, this is a gardening marker, y'all. This is made to withstand UV rays and moisture outside. Um, so you can use it on wood and tape and it holds up for a season. So this is the 128 plug tray. You can find these on our website if you need them. Um, and it is filled with a very different mix than what the blocking mix is. This is just plain any type of potting soil. I'd make a big point out of trying to get something that doesn't have any chemicals in it. They put all kinds of mess in potting soil anymore, y'all. Um, and it's 50% potting mix, 50% finished compost. I would recommend that you buy potting mix and a bag of finished compost. It does not matter if it's composted manure, composted whatever, Com just plain compost. Um, there's a lot of different brands out there, but that way you just know pretty much that it is actually finished. And when I say finished, that means that it's gone through the cooking stages and is pretty much done. So, all right, let's put these in order so I don't screw this up, y'all. All right, so we're going to start off with our Pro Cut Bouquet Mix. Um, so we buy all the weed. There's, I think there's 13 colors of Pro Mixes now in the, um, not Pro Mix, Pro Cut. There's 13 different colors. So we make a several different mixes with them. And we do that so we can know that there's equal amounts of all the different colors. So let me just move this so you guys can see. Oh, pull this back a little bit. Um, so we filled this up with just the dry mix. And I am literally just dropping one seed onto the top of each cell. And we'll, you'll see what we do to finish these off. And um, so we make a couple of mixes with the Pro Cuts, which um, that way we know there's equal amounts. Um, this Pro Cut Bouquet Mix would be what I would grow if we were still in production um, here on the farm. This is what we would grow every week pretty much exclusively. Um, but we, of course, now have a learning garden, an education garden here. So we're adding in just so many different colors. But this is the go-to. This is the industry standard. This is what sells every week. That's the last one of those. Um, and it just makes it easier, y'all. So much easier. And if I was selling to a commercial customer, they don't need to know that there's a variation in the oranges. You just sell it as sunflowers you know, orange, um, and then they will totally fall in love with how some of the blooms face upright. That's the horizon. Um, I know some growers that only grow that one, although there are times when I'm glad I don't have that one. These are the peach that I'm now putting down. Peach is a new color, um, and we bought up 100,000 or so 
of the peach seeds and got the last of them. And there we're down now. There's no more jumbo seed packets. We do have the regular size seed packets. Um, and we're just crossing our fingers that we get some soon because everybody loves it. I mean, who doesn't love a flower that has the word peach in it, right? This is the sun filled green. So let's talk about that a little bit. So sun filled green, there's two colors of sun fill. There's this green and then there's one called purple. And it's not so much about the bloom as it is the foliage on the outside of it, right? Um, so I only grow the sun filled green. I might occasionally grow some purple in the fall, but we like to use dark colored flowers, not foliage at that time of the year. Um, I feel like sun fill is the filler we have all been waiting for. I mean, you can time it just like you do the sunflowers. Um, and it is just an awesome, and you can start cutting it as soon as it's big enough to make a difference in a bouquet is when I start cutting it. I strip almost all the foliage off, but a couple of leaves at the top. Um, and it's just been super useful. It is so helpful. Our bouquet mixers, uh, makers truly love it. All right. So let me, um, start pushing these in. So I'm just putting my fingers and just putting it on top of those seeds and pushing it down about halfway through the cell. Then what's going to happen is I'm going to take these into the grow room, put them on the floor. I'm going to water this tray really well, making sure the, it's wet all the way through. That is going to not only um, water the seed, but that is going to wash the excess a mix off of the walls of the cell and cover the sunflower because unlike snapdragons sunflowers like to be covered with soil to germinate best um, so that'll happen and then I'm going to pop this tray onto a seedling heat mat because when you heat the soil up all at one time makes them sprout quicker and more evenly off every step of seed starting I have heard every rigmarole way to do it and there's nothing wrong with that but the minute you throw your hat into a commercial world you want to do everything the quickest the fastest the most efficient and the least amount of work and that's what a seedling heat mat does for us so i'm going to take these trays this tray into the grow room water it pop it onto the seedling heat mat um, and then what's different about these than all my soil blocks is that once about 50 to 75 percent of them sprout, I then boot this tray because I typically do not have any grow light available at this time of the year. Put them right out in full sun and they grow out there until they're two to three weeks old and we plant them out in the garden. We plant them out into the garden into a 30 inch wide bed with no film, y'all. The beds you just saw earlier in the show of our annuals that are come and cut again, um, which means they go a long haul here on the farm. These sunflowers are already a third of the way through their life, this variety. That's the other thing I need to say. I get emails from people that are like trying this, but they're using all these different varieties. We are speaking of Pro cuts. Pro cuts are the, the variety that I've grown as a commercial grower. They're the most beautiful, longest base life. They're pollenless. They still have nectar for the bees. Pollenless makes them last longer in the base, y'all. Um, so you've got to read the information. If you're going to vary from my instructions of pro cuts, then you need to get your information to, ch to change up that those instructions. Um, so when you plant a pro cut out in the garden when they're two to three weeks old, they're a third of the way through their life. Why would you spend all that time and waste all those resources? So we prepare the bed as we do our other beds. We put into dry organic fertilizer. You can learn about what I use on my website. We sell it and we incorporate that. It's, I think, three pounds to 100 square feet. Um, incorporate that and then we um, plant. Five rows of sunflowers is what we're doing this year. We started doing that last year and saw absolutely no decline in the size from four rows. So you get a whole nother row in, five rows, and in the row, the seedlings are six inches apart. We hand water them in, um, and depending on your weather, they do need some irrigating or if rain comes. 
They definitely grow faster and more evenly when they get water, but we don't do any additional fertilization. They do benefit from netting for support. All it takes is one torrential rain to just lay them all down, but we don't net them because we plant so many and so often. Um, and then we just wait for them to bloom, y'all, 55 to 60 days. All right. So that's how, that's the sunflower lowdown. Um, so I am going to move, I need to do some little rearranging here. So I want to try, I'm going to answer your questions. Um, and I want to remind anybody that um, maybe has joined us late for the announcements. First off, you can learn more about me and the work we're doing over at the Gardener's Workshop, um, over at thegardenersworkshop.com. And um, I am just trying to get this up on my computer, y'all, so that I can see all of the comments is what I'm going for here. All right. All right. So I can see the comments over on there. Let's bring this. Stand by, y'all. Don't get dizzy. I'm moving you. It's like you're on a roller coaster, right? I'm going to bring you down and, oh, I see a lot of questions. You know, last week we couldn't see the comments over here on the phone, but I can see them this week. Jesse and I did some testing and um, anyway, I have my laptop here and I'm trying to just see if there's supposedly all the questions from YouTube and Facebook interface over here. So I'm going to start off at the top and answer your question. And I see lots of people saying hello. And if you guys don't know what the sunflower emoji is about, those are people identifying themselves as our online school, flower farming school, um, or one of our other big school courses, or even our on-demand classes. And so I love seeing all the sunflowers. That is so totally awesome. We have people from all over the world here. Um, and so I'm just looking for a question. I see that lots of people are talking amongst themselves and we so totally love y'all doing that. And so I see somebody is commenting about a potato masher me, when I was mixing the block and mix and friends, I'm telling you, it is the best tool for the job. I tried every gardening tool that I had. Potato masher is the very best. Oh, here's a question from Jennifer. I've okay. So I can, so Jennifer asks, I've taken the soil blocking class. I seem to always err on the side of too dry. Every time I watch you, yours are pretty juicy. How juicy is too juicy? Well, that is just such a great question, Jennifer. And I think I say in the class, because then I try to say it often, it is always easier and better to have the soil blocking too wet than it is to have it too dry. When it's too dry, the blocks don't want to come out. And when they do, it just really pulls the tops up. Um, and so the ratio, the and that's why I also am an advocate of measuring. So it's like I've always used as an example, our small ready-made mix bag is approximately 20 to 21 cups of blocking mix. If you dumped all of that into your tub and then added about seven cups of water, that gives you a starting point. If the blocking mix, because the moisture content changes from order to order that we get. Sometimes it might take a little bit more. Um, that get, instead of you just scooping out some soil and adding water and adding water and adding water and adding water, if you measure everything, um, it helps you. But you want it to be like soggy oatmeal almost. Um, and if you're having trouble, I mean, if you get it too wet, all you have to do is tilt your, um, your tub up, put something under one end so all the water runs down there and make the best of it you can. Um, but I say it's better to be too wet than too dry. All right, so here's Lauren. My Pampas Celosia starts. Should I be trimming them to encourage branching? Are they a come, cut and come again once and done? 
So, um, Lauren, if you are speaking of Pampas Plume Celosia, there are um, just tons. I mean, I've literally, I think we've started at least 20 different types of Celosia Plume varieties and colors of Plume Celosias. Um, so if you're speaking, but yes, they are come and cut again, the majority of all of them. Um, and you can pinch them is, what's that is what that is called. The purpose of pinching is to get branching started earlier in the game. I'm a believer that I want earlier branching and earlier bloom. So I only pinch 50% of my, my crop back. And there's in my, and I soil block. I don't know what you do. I've never done this in plug trays. I'm not saying you can't. I'm just saying I've never done it. I do it in soil blocks. You can pinch it two different times. I can pinch while they're still in the tray before they're planted. Once they're about mm, two or three inches tall, you can pinch them back to about four leaves. And But you don't want to plant them out in your garden until you've allowed them time to recover. And what's the recovery sign to me? The recovery sign is when I see little sprouts sprouting where I made the pinch. That says to me, oh, okay, they're over me, you know, cutting the top half of their body off right? Um, and then the other time you can pinch, which is what I do often also, is after they're in the garden and they're, they've been established, meaning they've grown to about 12 to 18 inches, then you go in and do the very same thing. You don't want to pinch them and plant them or plant them and pinch them right away because those are two very stressful things. So we just try to stretch it out. So yes, you can definitely pinch them. All right. So Andy says, first time starting Amazon rows in blocks, plants not yet two inches tall and two have bloomed. If I pinch, will they keep getting taller? Thank you for all you do. You're welcome, Andy. Okay. First off, the Amazon, she's talking about Sweet William. Sweet William is a huge cash crop for flower farmers. Amazing bouquet fillers. Amazon the Amazon series is one of those that can take heat a little bit longer into the summer. And you're not going to be growing. I'm not going to be growing sweet William in the middle of the summer. It just gets too hot here and it just doesn't get tall enough and it suffers. And we are too busy with warm season stuff, right? However, having sweet William as long into the summer as it makes sense for you in your conditions really, really works well. Amazon is very predisposed to that early blooming in the tray sometimes or even right after you bloom them. I mean, after you plant them. So you can pinch it, but I would just sometimes I just ignore it and let it go on. I mean, it's probably not all of them. Two just bloomed. Yeah, you can pinch them. Do whatever you want to do to them. That's just it just happens. Um, plant them out in the garden when they're about three to five inches tall. Be sure to get them acclimated. Um, and they should be fine. And I don't normally pinch Sweet William. Um, you can pinch Sweet William, but I don't normally do it. So somebody, oh no, I started snaps a week ago. She covered with vermiculite, so now I'm worried. Well, first off, it just doesn't do any good to worry y'all. Put worry out of your vocabulary. It's like you either face up that you may have potentially did it incorrectly, but this is a learning curve. So it's really okay. Just wait and see what happens. Um, and we don't put anything in the window. Um, I mean, we use seedling heat mats, and it just is the way to get more seeds to germinate more uniformly, more of them, and more quickly. Um, so we always use a seedling heat mat. So it's, you really can't gauge a windowsill. Windowsills get cold at night, warm, really hot, potentially during the day. Um, so that is the problem with that. So Chris is asking... If I put row cover over Lysianthus plants out, do I need to harden off before planting? So Chris is asking, so Lysianthus is in fact a cool flower. So Lysianthus prefers or performs beautifully 
and with less care when they're planted at least six to eight weeks before your last frost date. So if you are planting after that time, um, that window, that means that it's probably warmer and I wouldn't be row covering them because that will intensify the heat, which they're, they're looking for cool. They want to put down roots in cool conditions. Um, so I would not row cover them. And I would definitely harden them off like under a carport or something like that. I asked this question last week and she said, row cover can replace hardening off. I was thrilled to find this out. I also said for cool season, hardy annuals. I did not say that for warm season. I always try to preface that. Um, and, and I know we talk about it. Warm season, tender annuals definitely need to be hardened off in the traditional way, seven to 10 days outdoors in the heat, sun, wind, gradually, however you do it in your setup. Cool season hardy annuals potentially can be hardened off in the garden under hoops and row covers. That's because it's cold outside, y'all. Six to eight weeks before your last frost date is the other window of planting cool flowers other than fall. And it's cold outside then. So that's why you can do that. Um, and so that is probably one of the biggest problems that I see that people take bits and bites of information and it can really lead to a tragedy. So um, that's true for cool flowers in cold conditions, but not warm season or cool season plants in warm conditions, which is really when not when they're supposed to be. Um, yes, I see that Joyce has that next. Thank you, jo Joyce. And we can't say these things enough. I mean, I say um, I say the same things 10 times every day. And there's just so many people, new folks coming in, which is what we're trying to provide for. So everybody just, you have to remember to say those things over and over. And I appreciate so much when you guys help us out. If I may be so greedy as to ask one more question, is there a quick and dirty list uh, or chart of which plants are multi-cut and which are cut one cut wonders? I have my own personal, but not everybody. And see, the problem with that Jennifer, is this. What is a one cut for me is not necessarily a one cut for you. A one, people in the northern parts of the world, here in the States, like in New England, bells of Ireland are like zinnias for them. They, con they continue to produce. Not true for me. So that's why, you know, each person, that's one of the things I teach in flower farming school, we have to make our own databases. You have to create your own list from your own experience for your own conditions, your own level of, um, and of growing. So there really isn't because you need to make your own. So Mary Catherine, I love Mary Kathleen. I love your name, by the way. I have lisianthus that are hardening off now. I'm past my last frost days. Is it okay to get my lisianthus into raids beds? You know, again, lisianthus is a cool season hardy annual. It's in the book, Cool Flowers. Um, the optimal time is six to eight weeks before your last frost date. We actually fall planet also here. It's winter hardy. Cornell University says to zone six, I think. Um, so yes, for sure. If it's hardened off, get it outside. Nicole asked, do you pinch your corn flour? I think you're talking about bachelor buttons. Um, no, we do not. We direct seed it. And I take the first cut as the first pinch. So Facebook user is asking, is this your last week of peach sunflower planting? No, if I had the seed, which I do still have seed, I would plant them all summer um, because that's just a hot color. But the seed's not available. So if I could, somebody's asking, we, as, as of Thursday, we do still have peach sunflowers in the small regular size pack. The jumbos are sold out. Um, so you can find those over at the gardenersworkshop.com on the store. Oh, there you go. Looks like Jesse's busy um, post and question. Heather, I have 25 peach sunflower seeds. They take 50 to 60 days to bloom. I want to have them for an event September 4th. Should I start them 68 days out? What would you suggest? What a good question, Heather. And let me tell you, here's what a flower farmer would do. First off, we never 
promise flowers on a certain date. So if I had a certain day I was trying to have sunflowers for, I would start five weeks of sunflowers with 50, 60 days back from the middle date. I would start some the week before that and some the week before that. I'm afraid to say if you only have 25 seeds, that's not very doable for you. Maybe you need to get more seeds or um, have a backup plan because weather happens. You cannot and day length happens. So when did you say that was? September 4th. So the days are, are a little shorter, but not much. Um, so I would plant a four to five week window around that date is how I would handle that. You soon learn as a, I mean, we teach people, I teach people this in flower farming school. You would, I mean, this may be your own personal event or something. I would never commit to a customer like that. I, you know what I say to people? It's like, yes, we do plant peach sunflowers all season. And if I've got them available, your name is on our list to get them that week. But I can't promise you that we'll have them. We'll only know if we're going to have them the week before. That's the way you sleep at night. So Jenny is, is talking with somebody there. Some folks in the southeast and northeast are just it's exhausting wind. The weather is exhausting, y'all. This time of the year for us, the wind coming and going, hot to cold. I mean, we had a, we lost a lot of our peony buds four weeks ago. Half of our peonies have half the buds they normally do. It's just, this is the life of flower farming. So Facebook users, after 30 years of starting plants in my basement, basement this year, my Lysianthus plugs came with fungus gnats and some other small, long-legged flying insects. The sticky yellow traps are just loaded. Had your gnat troll on hand, so I started right away. Am I doomed to have them year after year now? Well, I can't say this for certain, but most plug producers use beneficial insects to control fungus gnats. So you have to really, those may or may not have been fungus gnats on your plugs is what I'm saying. We actually use beneficial insects on a, in our warehouse for our soil for the very same reason. Um, they aren't flying insects though. Um, but so I don't know to answer that question. I would take those sticky traps to an extension agent and get them to, or if you can, or to a bug person and get them to identify for sure. The long legged ones may have actually been the beneficials. Um, so I don't know what to say to you, but no, because after you go through winter, if you shut down your grow room over winter, your basement, that typically will break that cycle. Have I harvested a peach sunflower yet? No, I have not, but I've talked to people that have. Who knows whether the necks are soft, but I will tell you that in general, we're getting close to the end here, y'all. I will tell you that in general, any specialty sunflower, and it's not just pro cuts, it's all of them. Um, the special colors, almost all their necks are soft. No, I do not know the reason why. Um, and so, but we find ways to make the best of that and how to use them. And our commercial customers like the white light and white night are wonky. We definitely have learned that putting a splash of the hydrator quick dip, you can find that on our website too and read about it. We put about a tablespoon of that in a gallon of water in our harvest buckets and that helps to firm them up some, but they definitely need, just like snaps, they definitely need to be kept totally upright, a little hydrator, um, and keep them straight. But the verdict is still out on peach. We will see how that all goes. I'm just looking. So Kelly, I'm going to answer this one last question and then we're going to wrap it up here, friends. I assume my heat mat would always be warm to the touch. Oftentimes they are not set at 72 degrees. Is that right? Well, so you have a heat mat that has an external thermostat, sounds like. Um, and if it is 
to the temperature, then it may not be on. Um, but I will also tell you that heat mats, depending on which one you have or what brand, some brands burn out quicker than other brands. Um, and so I would definitely monitor that. I mean, I would take a day that you're going to be home, just like I tell how I tell people how to figure out if you have full sun in a spot, you have to stay be home for a day at 8 a.m. Set the alarm on your clock on your phone for 8 a.m. Go out and put your hand on it. Set it for nine o'clock. Walk back out. And when the alarm goes off, put your hand on it. Do that throughout the day and see what it's doing. And then especially even in the evening and the nighttime hours. And that way you'd really figure it out. It may just so happen to be that during the time you're touching it is it doesn't need to be on. Um, but in whether it should be on 72 degrees depends on what it is that's actually on the heat mat. So friends, that's it. We're going to wrap it up again. Um, thank you guys so much for joining me here. Would love for you to subscribe to my channel. If you're on YouTube, like my page and like and share this. If you're over on Facebook, it helps me so much. I would love to see your faces here on our open garden and our open warehouse. People literally come from all over the country. I don't, it's not that I feel like we have something that great y'all, but apparently people just love coming here. My little urban farm, which um, you know, our peony should be doing the show. Um, we have, we're, that's why I'm trying to get my warm season, some stuff in our corn will be planted. Cool flowers will be going. Um, and then of course, people love to come to shop our warehouse, which the doors are never open. Um, it's not open to the public except this one day a year, especially if you want to come by heavy stuff like silage tarps and soil and ho things that, you know, that have increased shipping on them. Um, and then I'm going to, Oh, I see one more question from Lisa. Question. I have started marigolds. I took your class and they're beautiful. They are two inches tall. How long should I keep them inside? And I'm concerned it's still too cold here in the Pacific Northwest. Well, marigolds are warm season tender annuals, Lisa. So nighttime temperature 60 or above is the goal, unless you're going to do what we just saw out in the garden and three to five inches is what I'm looking for to put them out. So if they aren't, if it's not those temperatures yet and you don't have hoops and row covers, then I would pinch them when they get three inches tall to get them branching to buy you more time in the tray. So friends, I would love for you to like this, love it, share it with your friends, subscribe, check out the gardener's workshop subscribe. Oh, forgot to say, you need to be sure to subscribe to my weekly farm news, which is really just a front page kind of newsletter with a bunch of different things you can choose from. I have a brand new 50 foot cutting garden kit. No, it's not what it's called. The 50 foot cutting garden to go kit. And with all my tips, um, and planting diagram, and it's like a $25 savings. It's the seeds, the netting, um, the flower food, the Gerber tabs, um, and that'll be coming out on my newsletter this Wednesday. You won't find it on my website until then. Um, it's a hundred bucks and it's $25 savings. I would love for you guys, and we're only having it for a limited time. Um, it would be an excellent Mother's Day gift too, by the way. Let her grow her own flowers. Um, all right, friends, until we meet again, thank you so much. And I appreciate y'all being here and hope you have a great week. Ciao.